Okay, turn with me to John 15, please. John chapter 15. Now, Father, before we go any further, we thank you for what we've got up to this point. We thank you for good things that are stirring on the inside of us, and now we pray for the rest of what you have for us. Show us things we need to see tonight. Help us to be specific and accurate according to the perfect will of God for us tonight. Lord, open our eyes. Help us to hear and understand. Grant us revelation tonight that would help us right where we're at. You know each one of our lives down to the detail. You know exactly what we need to hear and experience tonight. We pray that any manifestations of the Holy Spirit that would help people tonight, that they would come on strong. Any word that we need, which I know we do, that word would come forth and go into our ears and down into our hearts and, so to speak, into our blood. So, Father, thank you for helping us tonight. We purpose, by your grace, that we'll be doers of the word and not hearers only. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn to John 15. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right, let's look here in verse 1. I'm going to read some of the same scriptures we read on Sunday. Um, I think we're going to get a little more meaty tonight, though. Uh, some similar things that we talked about on Sunday, but we're going to get a little more meaty in it. I think it's time. I mean, the end of all things is at hand. The devil's not pulling any punches. We need to hear what the Spirit's saying, comfortable or not. And so John 15, verse 1, Jesus is doing some powerful teaching personally here to all of us. And he said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Okay, one translation, Jesus said, I am the real vine, and my Father is the gardener. And then he talks about us being the branches. But before we go to that verse, one of the things we need to see about verse 1 here is that why would Jesus say, I am the true vine, or I am the real vine? Why not just say, I am the vine? Because there's other vines that you and I can be connected to by our choice. There's other vines we can be hooked up with. There's other plans. There's other purposes. There's other directions we can be going. Just because you're born again and saved and heaven bound doesn't mean you're going to be on the perfect will of God road all your life on the earth. You can be involved with other things other than the things of God and still be a Christian and go to heaven when you die. Why would, he, why would you say, I'm the true vine? Why not just say, I'm the vine? I'm the one and only vine. Because there's other things people can be hooked up with. And there's other things many people are hooked up with that are not Jesus, and they're not seeing fruit, they're experiencing unnecessary adversity, and it's not because God wants it, it's because they're hooked up to things that God never told them to be hooked up to. Anybody want the full nourishment from God to you? Well, it's place dependent. I said, if you want the full nourishment and the full flow of everything God has, if you want it, you got to be in the place He wants you to be. Not, yes, physically, but also mentally, Commitment-wise, how many know you can be in the right place but not as committed as you should be in that place? Right. That means you still got some adjusting. That just because you're in the right atmosphere doesn't mean you're in the right levels of commitment and seriousness about what the Lord's called you to do in that place. All right, so he says, I'm the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch, say this, I'm a branch. I'm a branch. Every branch, Jesus says, in me that bears not fruit, the husbandman or the father takes it away. That's pretty serious stuff. How important is it to the Lord that we bear fruit? This language here shows me this is one of the most important things the Lord expects out of us, and that is fruit. Increase. Hmm? 
You know, when he gave that story of the five talents, the two talents, and the one talent, it's talking about a, re a relationship between the Lord and how the kingdom of God operates. It said the Lord gave one guy five talents, get another guy two talents, give another guy one talent. And when the guy with five talents came back and said, Lord, look, I've gained another five talents. And the Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over many things. It's almost like, I never saw this before, but it's almost like we can also see that, you know, maybe he was saying the five talents was a few talents, or maybe he was saying, listen, I know you haven't been 100% faithful in everything, but you've been faithful in a few things. Mm. Now I'm going to make you ruler over many things. How many glad you don't have to be 100% perfect yeah. to hear well done at the end of your life? Yeah. He said, you've been faithful over a few things. He could have said, you've been faithful over everything, but obviously he wasn't. Come on, we're still works in progress, right? Yeah, yeah. Diamonds in the rough. <laughs> we're growing here. We haven't, if Paul hadn't arrived, we haven't arrived yet. Right. So the Lord said, you've been faithful in a few things. I'm going to make you rule over many things. And then the guy with two talents, we're talking about bearing fruit. The guy with two talents said, Lord, look, I've, I've got two more besides the two you gave me. And the Lord said the exact same words to the guy with two because amount in the Lord's eyes doesn't mean much. Faithfulness is what means so. It's very interesting to me that the guy that multiplied two talents to four heard the exact same words as the guy that multiplied five talents into ten. Exact same words. Well done, you good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Exact same reward but different amounts. See, we, we say it all the time in the church, even in the ministry of helps. Rewards in heaven and even on the earth are not passed out, are not given out because of status. Right. Well, I'm of this and I'm of that and I've got this and I've got that. Rewards are handed out because of service, not status, faithfulness, doing what you're told to do. And the guy with the one talent, you know, you know the whole story, right? The guy with one talent said, Lord, I knew that you were a hard man and you reaped where you didn't sow and blah, 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 blah. And the Lord basically said, I'm going to judge you out of your own mouth. You say, huh? All right. Well, you know what? Um, you should have taken that one talent because he, he just buried it. You know, he's, I was afraid. He buried his talent, came back to the Lord and said, here, Lord, here's the talent you gave me. You know what the Lord said? Wicked, Wicked servant. You should have at least given that talent to the exchangers and gained interest on it. So when I came back, at least I got the one talent with some interest. And this is what the Lord said. Oh, you talk about politically incorrect. The Lord, the Lord said to the guy with the one talent, they, they, he told the servants, take the one talent from the one. Take it from him and give it to the guy that has ten. You talk about politically incorrect, but it's kingdom of God totally correct. What does that show us? It shows us that God expects us to do something with what he gave us. Right. He expects us to not stay the same. He expects us to increase. He expects much fruit. Everybody say much. He expects it. Now, not that he doesn't love us if we're not bearing fruit. He did not. He did, he, the man is not portraying that God doesn't love people to do that. He's just saying, listen, you don't use it, you lose it. Now, we know that in the natural. You don't use it, you lose it, right? We know that. You tie your arm up in a sling for three years, don't ever use the muscles, what's going to happen? It's going to wither. Just by the law of withering. <laughs> right? You, you use it or you lose it. You know... Do you know that giving everybody equal shares is totally unfair? According to God? Totally unfair. Everybody having equal in God's mind is totally unfair. He even talks about it in the area of rewards. Some getting this reward, some getting that. Some people even talks about us being like the stars. Some are going to be brighter and some are not going to be as bright in the, in the life after. Paul refers to that in 1 Corinthians 15. Giving everybody equal is not fair. <laughs> Somebody say amen, please. Help your pastor out just a little bit here. 
turn, oh, keep, keep reading here. We okay? You doing all right? Yeah. You going to hear what I say next? Okay, let's read this here. So net, verse 2 says, Every branch in me that bears not fruit, it says the Father takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, He purges it or prunes it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. So let's just pray this prayer again. Lord, prune me. <laughs> Come on, instead of just praying for increase, instead of just praying for more blessings, maybe we need to pray, Lord, prune me. Now pruning is a great thing. I don't know why people think it's such a negative thing. It's a great thing. God's not the evil pruner looking to break little branches. He wants to see more fruit. He, just like you in the trees and the bushes at your house, if there's dead leaves and, and, and branches that are, that are sucking life and not doing anything, or those suckers at the bottom, you're not cutting them off because you hate that tree. You just want to see a better tree. And, and God's not talking about physical illness here. He's not talking about doing harm to us. He's talking about helping us to identify things in our life that are sucking a bunch of time, money, and energy that is not producing hardly anything. Right. And sometimes God will put His finger on stuff that you really, really, really like. But when you start to analyze it, you start realizing, you know what? I'm spending a lot of time on something that's producing very little according to my calling and my vocation that God's given me. Yeah. And you have to start identifying those things. You know, I, I'm, I don't want to get too much off track here because I want to get to some other scriptures here, but do you realize that Serving God is supposed to be nourishing, it's supposed to be fun, and it's what causes your joy to be full. I've got scriptures for everything I just said right there, and I'll share them as, the, as we have time. Serving the Lord, serving Him, being in His will, being in His perfect will every day is supposed to be satisfying, nourishing like you just ate a really good meal, it's supposed to produce fullness of joy in your life and lots of prosperity. But you start talking about serving the Lord and, and maybe doing more in the church or, hey, we've got this opportunity over here or let's call this prayer meeting together. We've got some extra meetings coming up. People are going like, oh, how much does the Lord expect out of me? Everything. <laughs> he expects your life. <laughs> when we made Jesus our Lord, that's pretty much saying, Lord, my life is no longer mine. You call the shots. Help me to use my will properly. Help me to make right decisions. And he will. But it's the greatest, most free, blessed, happy life there is living in the perfect will of God. It's satisfying. It, it, and he, here's the problem. The problem is this. People have so much stuff going on in their lives that when they start hearing the call of God to be more involved in ministry or in the church or doing this or doing that, they choke, not because serving God is unbearable, but because they're trying to add serving God into their already overbooked, stressed out lifestyle. So if you really want it to work right, you're going to have to not just cram God in. You know, God's an add-on. You're going to have to start deleting a bunch of stuff that he never authorized you to do that's just killing your time, killing your money, and then when it's time to serve God, you're too tired. Time to work or do something the Lord wants you to do, go pray for a neighbor or whatever, you're burned out because involved in a ton of stuff that the Lord never told you to be involved with. Carl and I, we learned some things a long time ago in ministry. We, we learned a long time ago that if I was going to give the Lord everything I knew He wanted me to give Him, and I, I, I'm a volunteer in this church, just like all of you that are volunteering in this church. There's some things I do that are connected to the paycheck that I get. I, there's all kinds of things I do that pastors don't have to do. I do all the time in the church. Everything from painting a wall, putting insulation in, sheetrocking, doing this, doing that, adding a window. I, I do all kinds of stuff like that. And I just do it voluntarily because I still got to do my pastoral duties on top of that. But we found out a long time ago, remember Carla, just years ago, we realized that if we're going to serve God properly and we're going to have enough time and energy to do what He wants us to do in the church to our neighbors, then we're going to have to get somebody to mow our lawn and we're going to have to get somebody to clean our house 
and we're going to have to get somebody to make some meals for us once in a while. And when we said that, our budget couldn't do it. But we got enough faith in our heart from the Word to realize if we will make this decision in the name of putting God first, the money will come. I can't imagine God not increasing our income or giving us some kind of favor to do these things that's taken all of our time if we're doing it in the name of putting His work first. It's a step of faith sometimes. I, I don't know, Carl, if we've ever had the money to do something the Lord told us to do. Church or home. It's always been, do this, but Lord, we ain't got the money. God says, I don't care if you don't got the money, do it anyway. Do it and the money will come. The Lord told me one time, not audibly, but in my heart, He told me, He said, Son, quit waiting for money to obey me. Obey me and the money will come. Because He tells you a lot of times to do things you don't have the money to do. But if you just start doing it, doing whatever you can, without writing hot checks, you know, doing, doing, taking whatever steps you can to, to do what the Lord told you to do, see, His vision attracts the provision. Just make sure he's telling you to do it. It's not just some right. tickle or idea, you know, that you got. So we learned a long time ago. So we, we, hired somebody, we hired somebody to this day to mow our lawn. I could do it. We could clean the house. We could cook all our meals. But how's that going to affect my service to the church? How that's going to affect my service to other people the Lord's calling me to minister to? If I have to do all that stuff, plus all this other stuff, plus all this other stuff, no wonder people are thinking it's hard to serve the Lord. Oh, He expects so much. No, He doesn't. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Right? What you got to do is you got to analyze your life and say, okay, why don't I have enough time to even work a little bit for the Lord? Why don't I have enough energy to go to church on Sunday. Why do I? And then as you start analyzing why, you're probably going to start seeing a bunch of stuff that needs clipped, pruned, right? How many know some stuff needs completely cut off? <laughs> I mean, just completely cut off, dry up, and be gone, burn in the fire. Because some people like try to hold on. Well, I'll just back off a little, and you know, just because they still got it under here. You know, I just some of it needs. You just need to cut it off. Just clip. Amen. Let the Lord clip it. He'll help you identify it. Show you what you need to do to get it out. And why does He do that? So you will bear more fruit. So if you really want to see increase in your life, don't just pray for increase. Pray that the Lord would help you to get some pruning done in your own life and in your own lifestyle. Now you're clean to the word I've spoken unto you. Now look, look what he said in verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. That word abide means continue and to stay and to settle down in. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. So look at verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Now, here's another interesting thought. You know, you don't, see a, you don't see a vine or a trunk in one branch, usually. You see a trunk or a vine in one branch, and another branch off of that branch, another branch off of that branch, another branch off of that branch, another branch off of that branch. Hmm? You see that? It's interesting because he is relating this to that, you know, this object lesson. And if you look at a tree or a vine, you'll see that a lot of branches are hooked to other branches that are hooked to other branches that are hooked to the vine. And if we were to not be hooked to a certain branch and we decide we don't want to be hooked to that branch, we're not hooked to the vine anymore either. That's why you need to realize a lot of this increase and a lot of the blessings of God in our life are place dependent, and not just physical place, but commitment place, right. attitude place, involvement. 
And so he's relating it to that. So you have to realize that sometimes you know, people think, well, I, I can just hear from God myself and I can just get all I want from the Lord myself. No, you can't. I can't, you can't, none of us can. If I was not where I'm supposed to be, hooked with the people I'm supposed to be hooked with, I would, not, I would, I would dry up. Probably wouldn't even want to go to church. There's many people that have left churches that the Lord called them to. Many people, and they have dried up. Do you know if you leave a church, no matter why you say you do, if you leave a church that God called you to, I have seen so many people leave a church, and then a few months later, they don't even go to church anymore. What does that tell you right there? Right. Well, I mean, what, 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 just that right there tells you they're not in the will of God. Because it's the will of God that we're all fitly joined to some place. He wants it to be because you want to. He's not going to make you or threaten you or anything like that. It's for our own good. And that's when you get the full blessing. I only got one more minute here, so let's just read a couple more verses and I'll let you go. In verse 6, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Now, I don't want to take a lot of time with this, but I used to look at this verse as, well, we got the abide in him part down. What we need to do is get his word abiding in us. And I agree to a degree that a lot of people need a lot more word in them. But I got to thinking, do we, do we really automatically abide in the Lord just because we're born again? Mm -mm. No, and, and this is the thing I, I see, because a lot of people think, I know my answer, just hear more word, just no more word, no more word. You also got to abide in His will for your life. You also got to remain in Him and what He wants for your life. For instance, can you be a child of God? Totally a child of God, loved by the Father, yet totally away from home. Hmm? Well, let's think of the prodigal son, right? The prodigal son. Got his inheritance from his father. Went away into a far country. Spent his inheritance on riotous living. Does the father still love him? Yeah. Is he where the protection of his father is? No. Is he experiencing the blessings of his father's house? No. Why? Because he's not living there. He's a son, but he's run away from home. Do you understand? Just because you're a born-again Christian in Christ Jesus doesn't mean you're abiding in him, in his house, where he wants you, in his things, hooked with his plan, hooked with his purpose. You can be a child of God on your way to heaven and experience all kind of junk on the earth because you're not abiding in him. Right. You're saved. You have his last name. But you can't experience what the Father wants you to experience if you're not where he wants you to be. Doing what he wants you to do. So... Look at verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified. Now, re read verse 7 again. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask whatever you want and it'll be done unto you. That's called fruit. Asking whatever you want and it being done unto you, that's called prayer fruit. And the Bible says in verse 8, in you bearing this kind of fruit, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so shall you be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue you in my love. How do we continue in the love of God? Verse, next verse. These things have I, excuse me, if you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. Even as I, the Son of God, have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Do you see here? keeping his commandments, and I'm talking about doing what his written word tells us to do, what your conscience is telling you to do, what your heart's prompting you to do, what the Spirit of God's telling you to do, little things, big things, everything in between. If we will do what the Lord wants us to do, we're abiding in his love. 
If we don't do those things, He still loves us, but we're not abiding in His love. We're out here somewhere else in a far country somewhere or whatever doing our own thing. Doesn't mean we're not children. Doesn't mean that heaven's not our home. Doesn't mean we can't come back and repent. But it does mean we won't experience the blessings of abiding in His love if we're somewhere else and we love something more. That just makes sense, right? And so look at the next verse and we'll close. He said, These things have I spoken unto you, verse 11, These things have I spoken unto you about abiding and continuing and keeping my commandments. These things I've spoken unto you that you guys might throw a drag and have a very boring life and it'd be very, very hard. Amen. Good night. <laughs> All right, for those of you that are listening online or later in life, uh, that's not what it said. No. <laughs> what it said, Jesus said, These things I have spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Right. Okay, church, I just want to encourage you. Just get some time alone with God and let the Lord know that you are open and willing to stop anything that's not bearing fruit. Even stuff you really, really, really like. Let him know that you're open to starting anything that he wants you to start. Doing anything he wants you to do. Adjusting anything he wants you to adjust. Hmm? Let him know. Think of the hardest thing that you could possibly do. Tell him you're willing to do it. Tell him you're willing to do it. Now, it might take a few moments of prayer to get in that attitude of where it starts to really stir in you and make sense. Do it. I'm telling you, when we're living in the will of God, everything is going to get better. Everything. A lot of depression in people's lives today is because they're not abiding in the Lord and it's the reason their joy is being messed with. People are taking pills for depression. People are changing their diet for depression. I'm not saying all these things are wrong. People are seeing, get, seeking psychiatric help for, to get out of depression. They're trying to get in a different relationship to get out of depression. If you do all those things but don't do the number one thing that causes your joy to be full, not sure you're going to have permanent victory. I wish people would look to the will of God before anything to see why depression is settling in your life. I know there's other reasons for depression. You could be in intercession for somebody and you need to pray it through and, you know, joy will rise up in the inside of you. I know the devil, sometimes you're in the perfect will of God and depression comes. You got to put your foot down and say, devil, I resist your oppression in Jesus' name. But there are times that depression is experienced in people's lives because they're where depression is. They're not where God, God's will is, fullness of joy. And his will is not hard. He said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You better stand up or I'll keep preaching. He said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So we know if we hook up with God, it's going to be easy and light and our joy is going to be full. Would you pray this with me before you go? Say this, Heavenly Father, I'm asking for light. Shine upon my life. Point out anything that's not in line with your perfect will for my life. Even little thoughts, habits, relationships, anything. Let me know what I need to know so I can be in your perfect will. Your will is amazing. It's not hard. It's the best life for me there is. I'll adjust. I'll change. Stop or start anything that you want me to. Thank you, Lord. And I heard the Spirit of God say, Kapufo, Jononteke, Ikra, Mantieglo, Vuutsa, Kijabatanglanya, Egle, Vitosa, Bakachi, Ventilier, Pangono. I heard the Spirit of God say, look at your lifestyle and make sure you have time to seek the Lord on a daily basis. He didn't say, give us this week our weekly bread. 
He said, pray this way, give us this day our daily bread. In these days especially, says the Spirit of God, you need to be in close fellowship with the Father. You need to be looking to Him in faith, believing you hear His voice and a stranger you will never follow. Look to the Lord because you'll need direction every day and it won't be hard and it won't be a struggle. It'll be light, it'll be easy, but it will take faith because you won't see how doing His will can get you ahead. You won't see how doing His will only can bring you up. You'll think, no, I've got to exercise more effort. I've got to work longer hours. But here the Lord says to you, church, just hear from heaven. Do what the Lord tells you to do. Do it with all your heart. Be diligent in your work. And then believe that He'll take care of you. Believe that the resources will come and the increase will happen. Just believe it will and you'll see it, saith the Lord. Amen. Amen.